The great theologian Winnie the Pooh said, did you ever stop to think and forget to start again? Nothing? Have you guys had breakfast? That's it. You haven't had your Cheerios. I know an awful lot of people who don't think. How about you? And I'm at the lead, I'm at the lead, I'm the lead dog in this one. God has given you a billion dollar body and a trillion dollar brain. And we don't use either one very much. Can I hear an O oh, me? See, I'm from Kentucky, the state of fast women and beautiful horses. And I want to tell you what, we, we wouldn't treat our horses like some of us in this room treat our bodies and our brains. And I'm here today to tell you that God wants you to break the bondage that your brain has been in. He wants to free your mind, set you free, and allow you to think big thoughts because your life will never be any bigger than the biggest thought you are able to think. Now, this sin is not a sin we come by easily because everything about us when we're children wants to be imaginative, creative, and curious. But we're told and we're slapped and we're corrected and we're punished for creativity <coughs> and curiosity from the time we were born. Remember when you prayed for the time your kids would speak? And now you pray for the time they'll shut up. Ever had a four-year-old ask you this question 700 times within three minutes? Here it is. Why? Why? You can't have that. Why? And you never have a really good answer? Or something in our brain that churns to want to know, to expand, to embrace. George Bernard Shaw said this, few people think more than two or three times a year. I've made an international reputation and a small fortune for myself by thinking once a week. Helen DeGeneres said, they tell us that we only use 10% of our brains. Imagine what we could do if we would use the other 60%. Ah, right, now, see, I knew you were going to get awake. Let me go back and do the Winnie the Pooh thing again. <laughs> we're in a series called Moo Out Loud, how to stand up and be heard above the herd. Everyone I've ever met wants to be heard. We live in a town of creatives. We live in Nashville, Tennessee, Music City, USA. We have the greatest creatives, at least on par of any other great city in the world, living right here. Did you know that? Writing songs, creating we are the number one, the largest publisher of Christian literature in the world. Writers, singers, songwriters, and every one of us, no matter what we do, whether we work in a factory or in a football field, have a longing to think great thoughts and to contribute our verse, our song, our poem, to write something that will outlive us. So we've been talking about the five steps, the five practices of branding yourself, if you, if that, if you get connect to that, of building a reputation, of being someone we will all miss when you leave. Hello? No one wants to go through life just beige, boring, bothered, and burnt. All of us want to be heard. So, practice number one. Before you do anything else, you have to free your mind. You have to break your brain out of jail. And running against God to God this week, I did a, a podcast called Breaking Your Brain Out of Jesus Jail. 
Because a lot of people think that Christians are people who are into conformity. Conform, be like us. Nothing could be further than the truth. You don't have to be like me. I don't have to be like you. We're all seeking to be who we are. How do you free your brain? You have to, first of all, free it from the tyranny of the trivial. The tyranny of the trivial. Listen to what Jesus said. I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food. Amen? Ladies, your body is more, the life is more than what you wear. Any feminine amen out there? Thank you. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. Here it is. How much more valuable are you than the birds? Who of you, by worrying, can add one single hour to his life? None of us can. So Jesus says, seek the kingdom and all of these things will be... In other words, all of the things that we occupy our mind with are trivial. Things that God will give us in addition to the other big things. What does seek his kingdom mean? Simply means understand what God's into and up to and embrace that. As I've said to you, God is doing three things. Redeeming, restoring, and reconciling. When you're into redemption, restoration, and reconciliation, you create art that supports those ideas you are seeking the kingdom. When you're calling people to unity in Jesus, you're seeking the kingdom. When you're giving a cup of cold water in the name of Jesus, you're seeking the kingdom. It's not this complicated, is it? Every day. But we are so preoccupied, worried about tomorrow, worried about the economy, worried about all this stuff. At the end of the day, it is trivial. Second, you've got to free your brain from the merry-go-round of more. Jesus said this, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. That word consist literally means hold together in the Greek. It's not glued together. He told this parable. The ground of a rich man produced a great crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no more place to store my crops. Now, you've probably heard this story before, right? It wasn't sinful that he was successful. It's what he did with his success. Here's a guy who is wildly successful with all this stuff, right? Right? And the biggest thought he could think is to have bigger barns for more stuff. If all you can think about is how you're going to house your stuff and hoard your stuff, I'm not sure God is all that inspired to give you much stuff. The merry-go-round of more. It's just always more, isn't it? The trivial things that that crowd our minds and bring them into bondage. The worry, the anxiety, the fear. God says, you know what? If you will seek my agenda, if you advance my agenda, advance my church, advance my cause, I'll I'll feed you. How's that? That's a good deal. It's not just more. It's what can we do with what? We have been given. And the third, not only do you have to free your brain from the trivial, from the tyranny of that, from the merry-go-round, let's just do what everyone else, just spin and get in debt and do what everyone else is doing. This is bondage. Does everyone here understand this? You also have to free your mind from your irrational fear of God. Now we're talking about... (coughs) The five practices that allow us 
to be able to free our inner rock star, to be significant and important, to make a difference, to be remembered, to be heard, to be regarded. As we should. This is why we are here. You got to free your brain. Let it out of jail. From the trivial, from just a myth of more. And you know what? I know this is simple stuff, but God created you. You're not an accident. God has redeemed you if you are a follower of Jesus. And he created your brain. He created you a thinking, acting, feeling person. He breathed into our mother and father, Adam and Eve, and we became a living nephesh, a living soul. We bear the mark of our father. We are creative. He loves us. He adores us. He cares about us. He wants a personal daily relationship with us. And yet we fear him. We keep him at arm's length. We talk about God at church. This is what I get paid to do, right? I talk about God for you, and you have God thoughts that are my thoughts, and you just assume I wouldn't lie to you much. But you need to have your own God life. And not be afraid of it. You know, the, the Bible says the beginning, the, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. I fear God. I do, but I love him. How does that work? Here it is. If you rebuke a mocker, you will only get a smart retort. Yes, he will snarl at you. Aren't you glad the Bible's archaic and doesn't relate to everyday life? People don't act that way today, do they? So don't, so don't bother with him. I love that. You, may, you come up against somebody who wants to argue about God, just go pish tosh. Pish tosh. Do you know what that means? Me either, but it sounds cool. Pish tosh. I'm not going to argue about God. I'm not going to do it. But a wise man, when rebuked, will love you all the more. Of course he will. Teach a wise man and he will be wiser. Teach a good man and he will learn more. For the reverence and fear of God are basic to how much wisdom? All. You know what the all means in Hebrew? All. That's right. Everything. All means all and that's all all means. Now, is this true? Is the fear and the reverence of God the basic core of where we start for all other wisdom. How about this? Knowing God results in every other kind of understanding. In other words, knowing God, thinking about God, pushing and pressing into God, praying and meditating God's word, scripts, Holy Scripture, feeding our soul, feeding our brain, setting it free, setting our core and our center into God. Results in inspiration and creativity and bigger ideas, right? There are three rational fears of God, it seems to me. I've watched this happen in my own life. First, there's a fear of what God might do to you. This is how I was raised. I was scared to death of God. You get out of line. This is God is, God is waiting to thump you on the head with a holy hammer. Just mess up one time. Smoke a, luck, a lucky strike and God will kill you dead. I feared God like I feared a rattlesnake. I didn't want anything to do with God other than to get a ticket to heaven. I pressed into that fear. And I went to the second level of the irrational fear of God. I, didn't, I no longer feared what God might do to me. I was afraid of what God might do with me. If I become a Christian, I'll become weird. Right? I'll sing Christian songs all day. I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Hey, down here. shut up. Right? And then I arrived at the third fear, and I still live with this fear every day. I'm not afraid of what God's going to do 
to me. Not even afraid of what God's going to do with me. I do live every day with a fear of what God might do without me. You see, I, I, I don't want to, I want to end on everything God has for me. Don't you? Is that just me? I might want it all, man. You know, whatever that is. And yet the rational fear of God, the tyranny of the trivial, and just the merry-go-round of more keeps us so preoccupied that our brains are in bondage. And I will have to say that my, my, my experience tells me that, that, that religious people are more susceptible to this than almost any other people. You do understand there's a big difference between religion and Jesus. Tell me, under at least intuitively, you know this is true. Religion is bondage. It doesn't lead to any good place. It brings your body, it shrinks your brain down to the size of a pea. There are three lies that religion propagates and tells. And these are lies that we believe. Because we're, see, here's, a, here's the thing, here's the terrible thing about religion. We, if you get introduced to religion early, it has its most potent defect on you. And here's the problem with religion when you're little. It's because you trust your mom and dad, right? You trust your pastor, you trust your leaders, you trust big people. And you think, they wouldn't lie to me. The problem is they're as much in bondage as you are now. They're just telling you the stuff they've been told. You know why? Because they don't have any bigger experience to pass on. Hello? So here are three lies of religion. One, religion says if you conform, God will, we, will reward you. Conform to what we demand, and God will reward you. Here are, here are our list of theological, religious, moral, ethical absolutes. There are churches who absolutely believe you can't go to heaven if you don't go to their church. Lie from the pit of hell. I got an email a couple weeks ago from a high school senior who's coming to college here next month or next uh, some, uh, in the fall and said, what, do you, what does your church believe about baptism? And I've been a pastor long enough to know, to know exactly what that question is. So I wrote back kindly. I said, you can be baptized enough times to be kin to a catfish and go straight to hell. How's that? You know what I got back? <laughs> what was that? Oh, oh. Did that burst your religious bubble? Good. I got back a five-page scripture-laden defense of baptismal regeneration. You know what I did with it? I deleted it. I don't, leave, I don't read trash. Are you with me? Anybody, anywhere who tells you you can be right with God other than faith in the person and the work of Jesus Christ is a liar and a dangerous person. Now, I know, I know. We got to be sweet and kind and nice and all that stuff. So in the attempt to reform... I'm going to quote someone in my life I have never quoted before. This is the first, and I probably will be the last. But I just couldn't pass this up. Adolf Hitler said, What luck for us rulers that men do not think. Wow. Wow. Yeah, but this is just religion, Dave. It's harmless. No, it is not. The only conformity that the Bible calls for is God's 
sovereign work in our lives as followers of Jesus to conform us to the image of his son. And if I could ever reflect the character and the nature and the love and the sacrifice of Jesus, I'm all in for that. If you conform, you will be rewarded. How many of you know that you can do everything that a church tells you you have to do to be accepted there and still be miserable? That's good, man. I'm telling you what. You know what you're talking about. Don't let anybody tell you different. Okay, I won't. Don't worry. Here's a second lie. If you perform, you will be loved. Oh, hallelujah. I mean, we all believe this lie in our brain. In our brain, this is where this lie resides. If I perform, I will be loved, right? If I don't perform, I won't be loved. This is a big deal. If this is what you believe about your relationship with God, no wonder you think little thoughts. You are in jail, brother. Your brain is in Jesus' jail. Somebody's put you in jail. If you perform, you will be loved. I mean, we're taught this from a very early age, aren't we? When mom and dad, now, God bless them. I know they meant this well, and, but you know, they wanted me to sing in the children's choir. And because this is, would make her look bad if, if I didn't. Because I have such an amazing voice. I have a voice. Quit laughing. And they say, you know, if you go sing in the children's choir on Sunday night, we'll stop by the Tasty Freeze and you can have hamburger and, and curly cues. Does anybody here ever had a curly cue? Huh? If that ain't health food... I don't want none. And, and you know, we, we get bribed. You know, now they, again, 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 mom and dad meant well. But I got this treatment everywhere. I got it at home. If you perform, I'll give you a cookie. If you perform, you'll be a good son. I got it at school. If you get good grades, you'll be smart. Listen, how many of you figured this out? There are a lot of really brilliant people who don't do well on tests. I mean, Einstein failed in school. Everybody get this? Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. I think that's just the most hilarious statement. They weren't just sinners. What kind of sinners were they? Notorious sinners. There's some notorious, notorious sinners in this room. I'm sure. This made the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with notorious sinners, even eating with them. Ew. So Jesus, <laughs> Jesus told them a story. All right, now, now you heard this before, so just be careful. If a man has 100 sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? All right, now just think a minute, okay? Are you with me? Think, 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 think. Are you thinking? Okay, now, tell me if I'm wrong. If you give me a hundred of your sheep, you with me? And I'm guarding these sheep and I'm taking care of these sheep. And man, I'm, I'm doing my job, you're happy. And for some reason, one, I lose one of them. If I leave the other 99 alone and go wandering out there somewhere to look for that one sheep, you tell me, are you going to be happy? Huh? Is this just me? I mean, we listen to this. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, gee, well, look what Jesus says. He says, man, if a man has 100 sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Well, he'll leave the 99, go in the wilderness and search and find them. Yeah, that makes sense. No, that makes no sense at all. That's dumb. 
I mean, I've already told Jesus this several times. He hadn't killed me yet. This is dumb. No, 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 no. This makes no sense. And it's why people hate Christianity. This is why people hate Christian. I understand why they hate Christianity, the eanity part. Because this makes no sense. This is not how we live. This is not how we value things. But this is how God values you. I think we need to stop reading the Bible like, oh, yeah, that, oh, absolutely. If Jesus said it, it must, it must make sense. No, it makes no sense. But, but, but listen, this, it, it didn't get any better. In the same way, there's more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns <coughs> to God than over 99 other who are righteous and who haven't strayed away. I mean, God's economy is all screwed up. Isn't it? Or is he trying to teach us something? People matter to God. You matter to God. He's turned this thing upside down. People matter to us when they perform. God says you can go astray, you can blow up your life, you can get divorced, you can go to jail, you can do anything that a man or a woman can do to sabotage their life, and I will still come after you. I got one thing to say to that. Yay, God. Yay, God. Yay, God, he doesn't add like we do. Yea, God, he isn't to, if you perform and you reform, I love you. But this is what we've been taught in religion, at home, at school, at work, everywhere. The only place this doesn't work is in real life. Because if you live with your life in this kind of bondage, you will live a torn up, twisted, small, selfish, neurotic existence. Trust me, I've seen it thousands of times in the last 40 years. But this is what we're taught, right? This is what religion teaches us. This is what morality teaches us. You got to conform. No, no, no. Don't con I'm telling you, don't conform. Love Jesus, follow Jesus, and be free. Well, I am free. No, you're not. Not until your brain is free. Not until you free your mind. Here's a third lie religion tells us. If you confess, you will be crushed. Right? See, a lot of us are carrying around hidden truth, lies. We're not telling nobody. Hello? If you have ever wondered why God created the church, it wasn't so we could have buildings with steeples so we would know where to find God when we lost him. God created the church, the gathering. Ecclesia means the gather, a gathering. To create an environment, a community, a neighborhood, a nation of men and women who knew how to love each other and be safe in each other's presence. Who are the safe people in your life that you can come clean with? Listen to me. Hide your hurts and you cut yourself off from healing. This is how God made us. He didn't make us to live with secrets. Oh, this is what we think. Man, I'm not going I'm, I'm to I, I, I'm not going to confess. I'm not I'm not I'm going to conform and I'm going to preform. I'm going to perform and conform. Perform and conform. How's that working for you? You see, you, 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 you don't moo out loud. You can't be creative. You can't be imaginative. You can't think your thoughts and live your life until you get your brain out of jail. I'm telling you, 
that you need safe, this is why God created the church, so we could be a safe community. Are we happy to hear that you don't believe in Jesus? No, but we're not shocked. Are we happy to hear that you don't ever pray Unless you're, in, you know, unless you're in trouble? No, but, we're, but we understand. Are you with me? Are we happy to hear that you're addicted to porn? Oh, yeah, happy day. No, but we understand. Are you with me? The gathering is a safe place. It's a place where messy people find the mercy of God. Amen? If it's not that, let's close up and go home. Because we got enough churches in Nashville to entertain us no matter what our taste may be. So what's the remedy to that? I mean, do you resonate with any of this? I mean, help me because if this is not good stuff, I don't want to I don't want to bore the second service. Maybe I can write a new one. Do any of you relate to any of this stuff at all? Okay, thank you. Good. What's the remedy? Now, I'm not, I'm not going to insult you to tell you that I know all the remedy. And that, you, I can, that, that, that even God's not going to fix it today. But I can, I can tell you this. I can tell you that you can start today. And this is important stuff. Because if you don't free your brain, free your mind, get out of jail, free your inner rock star, whatever, however it is you connect to this information. Then none of the rest of it matters. This is why educated people can't find jobs. Because an educated man in jail is still a man in jail. Here's what I want to ask you. Anybody here ever talk to yourself? Come on now, God is watching. Okay, good, because I'm glad I'm not the only one. Here are three things I want you to say over and 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 over to yourself this week. And I want to check you next week. And if you, if you, if, if you don't perform, <laughs> see, see, I'm good. I, mean, I got a seminary degree in this stuff. I can make people really miserable. It took me three years to learn how. All right, say this over and in. One, I have a standing. Say it with me. I have a standing. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you have a standing with God. How do you, you see? God is seeking a family. Another reason why He created the church. He's seeking a family. Now, how do you get in? I talked about this. I think I think I did on Christmas Eve. But how do you get into a family? Only two ways that I know of. You can be one, born into it, right? Two, adopted. Well, you can't be, I mean, you're not both, right? You're one or the other. And spiritually speaking, we have in Christ a double whammy. We are born again and we are adopted. Hello? It says this, see what great love the Father has lavished. Don't you love that word? Come on, tell me you love that word. Isn't that a cool word? I have memories of my childhood. One of the, my, I think I've told this story before. Most of the same memories of my brother is when, we'd eat, when my father would fix breakfast. That was awesome. My dad was an expert in breakfast any time of day. Anybody? Yeah. And uh, my dad would fix these little biscuits. They were like that tall, but they were awesome. Just hard enough, but just, you know, you could open them and put gravy on them. Amen. That was about, we, we're from Kentucky where gravy, any gravy is a health food. And I'm thinking, when my brother, though, God rest his soul, he would get two biscuits and open them up, and he would take the gravy out of the bowl. I can see the bowl, I can see the spoon. And he would, he would scrape it across the top, and then he would paint the top of the biscuit with gravy. Like there was gravy police at the, you know, making sure he didn't take too much. When I got my turn, oh yeah, I took that down to the bottom of the gravy bowl. I trolled for whatever was down there. Sausage pieces, 
candy, peanuts, anything, man. <laughs> wow. I, and I looked at that and I think, how, I mean, how pitiful. Gravy was not the, it was gravy rationing on that end of the table and gravy lavishing on this end of the table. Hello? I have a standing, ladies and gentlemen. I don't have just enough grace to get to heaven. I have enough grace for the trip. All the way, I have a standing. I am adopted, loved, born again, child of God. Sometimes we need to just stop. You know, God bless Tim Tebow. If he hasn't done anything else, he's gotten us out of the closet. You can, you, we, maybe more of us need to be Tebowing. I'm not an orphan. I'm not a mistake. I am a child of God, gifted, favored, and built for success. Say that with me. I am not an orphan. I am not a mistake. I am a child of God, gifted, favored, and built for success. Say that with me. I am not an orphan. I am not a mistake. I am a child of God, gifted, favored, and built for success. And everybody said, amen. Amen. I have a standing. Here's the second thing I want you to say. I have a calling. Say that with me. I have a calling. I have a standing. Say that. I have a calling. I have a standing. I have a calling. You have a calling. You know why they're so hard to find? It's because they seem too much like fun. I was talking with a young pastor, church planting pastor this week. His church has grown to over 600 people in about four years. He was sitting down. He said, I'm miserable. I said, really? Really, you're miserable. God has obviously favored you, blessed you. He said, you know, I just feel like it's going too good. I'm afraid something's going to happen. None of you have ever felt that way, right? I said, I'll tell you why you feel that way. Because it's too much like fun, isn't it? He said, yeah, it is. I feel guilty because I'm having so much fun. What? We can't win either way we go, can we? You have a calling. I would figure out what that is. Now, let me... In deference to my good brother, Dan Miller, in 48 days to the work you love, sometimes you're not going to love your calling because sometimes it is elusive and it's hard and it's difficult. We're going to talk about that. But down at the core of you, there is a, there is a passion for something that you need to embrace because not only can you be great at it, you can sustain this passion over the rest of your life. You with me? I have a standing. I have a calling. And third, I want you to say, I have a ministry. I have a standing. I have a calling. I have a ministry. Let's go. I have a standing. I have a calling. I have a ministry. And this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has, the word commit there is like the word, have you ever heard the, the, someone quote Paul saying, I know whom I believe and who, and who uh, that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day. What a beautiful soliloquy. It's the same Greek words, and it means to deposit. And he has deposited into each of us the message of reconciliation. What is your ministry? Now listen to me. All of you have a ministry. I'm not talking about Church work. I'm talking about the work of the church. Amen? You have a ministry. You have a standing. You have a calling. You have a ministry. 
You say, well, I don't know what that is. We, we don't care right now. We're going we're to go down that road. Right now, I just want you to free your brain. Okay? Stop thinking about how much it costs and what it means and what you... Oh, no, if, oh, if, I, have, if I say I have a standing and a calling in the ministry, God will send me to an African nation. I'll have to marry an ugly woman with a cow patty hat or do and be a missionary and sew slides in Baptist churches on Sunday night. <laughs> Father, I pray for these amazing men and women, far more gifted far more amazing, far stronger than any of them know as they sit in these seats. They think they're just average because this is all they have heard. They're normal. You're messed up. You're stupid. We didn't want you. God, I just pray. I want to repent right now in the name of the church for every person who's been abused by a preacher. I want to repent for every person in this room or watching, listening, or watching, who's ever been put upon in the name of religion. I want to repent for the 42 million Christians who won't go to church today because they've been to church. I want to repent for all the Christ lovers in America who are shriveling up, whose lives aren't making much of a difference. Not because they don't have a standing a calling, or a ministry, but they don't believe they're good enough, qualified enough, or righteous enough. That is a lie, dear Jesus. I pray that you will set these good, gifted, amazing, strong, brilliant, talented men and women free. Set them free and never let anyone, not me or anyone that looks like me, ever put their brain in Jesus' jail ever again. Jesus said, nothing is impossible with me. Let us think that thought. Amen.